gives me great pride and uh, privilege to announce our speaker tonight, Frank Panathini, who's on our museum staff. Uh, he will talk to us about Lafayette. An evening with Frank. <laughs> Well, this has been a long time in the making because it was originally scheduled for June of last year. <laughs> and as you know, events intervened. Uh, I have I, I prepared a script so I don't get too far off subject and don't uh, wander too much. But I will wander. I call it Lafayette. The Lost Hero. Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roche Gilbert du Montier, Marquis de Lafayette. That's the full <coughs> banner of his name. Gilbert de Montier. The Marquis de Lafayette is a title. He was one of America's first and most popular heroes. He became a rock star. Millions of people stood waiting on the roadside and cheered Lafayette when he traveled through America's 50 years after the revolution that he helped win. Without him, this country might not have won its war of independence. Many have forgotten him now, except for vague memories from a history book or from the names of dozens of places, streets, squares, cities, and counties named for him in the country today. Whether it's a Fayetteville, or Lafayette, or Fayette, all dedicated to him. France and America have always had a strange love-hate relationship. Americans say the French are snobs, but admire their sense of style. The French think Americans are violent, and uncivilized, but love to imitate them. But common values have always bound us together and made us allies when it really mattered. The Marquis de Lafayette, this figure from a distant past, a foreigner, a Frenchman, can tell us something important about ourselves and help us remember a time when America became the symbol of freedom in the world. Lafayette left us part of the story in his memoirs and letters. He was born in a small village in Chavagnac in Auvergne province, just two years before the death of his father at the, in the Seven Years' War in England, with England. Many of, Lafayette's, many of the Lafayettes have died fighting for France. Scholars agree about the basics of his early life. His father was killed at the Battle of Minden when he was two years old, and his mother sort of retreated to Paris and very rarely came home. He was a natural boy. He was educated in the countryside. He lived with the peasants. He was a lonely child, and he fancied himself, even at a young age, as a gallant knight out against all bad things that could happen to people. And he kept that self-image throughout his life. At age eight, he stalked the woods, hoping to confront a wild beast rumored to be threatening the neighborhood. While he may have been forgotten in other places, he is still revered in the province of Auvergne at an annual summer festival. At age 11, his mother sent for him to join her in Paris at the Palais du Luxembourg, one of the grandest homes of the city. Shortly thereafter, his mother died, leaving Lafayette a very wealthy orphan. Around 1773, at the age of 14, he was a wealthy and eligible bachelor and is introduced to the charming Adrienne de Noailles, N-O-A-I-L-L-E-S, Noailles from one of the most well-connected families in France. Getting to know each other with visits to her home and walks in the park, she became the most important person in his life. He became probably the richest, most privileged, most envied couple in France. 
That's saying something in that age. She was an extremely protected young girl from the highest ranks of the aristocracy. Her family's elegant townhouse, the Hotel de Noailles, has gardens overlooking the Seine in Paris. Adrienne was only 12 years old when her father proposed Monsieur de Lafayette to his wife as a match for her or one of her sisters. Adrienne's mother initially thought Lafayette's huge wealth was a mixed blessing, but came to appreciate his finer qualities after getting to know him. They were married when she was 14 and he was 16. It was an arranged marriage that became a beautiful love story. Now married to such an illustrious family, Lafayette was taken to the balls of Marie Antoinette, while his wife's family sought to gain him a place at court. He chafed under the customs and posturing of the court just for the chance of a supper with the queen. On one occasion, the shy Lafayette was singled out to dance with the young queen. At some point, the queen stopped the dance and laughed at him, and the whole court joined in. His friends never let him forget that. At a masked ball, he quips to the Comte de Provence, the future King Louis XVIII, and a key to launching his career at court. When the Comte bragged about his wonderful memory, Lafayette said to him, memory is a fool's substitute for wit. <laughs> Saying something like that to a prince of the blood and future king was Lafayette's sure way to get himself cut off from life at the court. Teenage defiance became a form of revolution. Lafayette's family went back seven centuries as a military family. Noblesse d'épée, nobility of the sword. Lafayette was raised on stories of his family glory at war. He needed to find his own way to that glory. He joined his father-in-law's regiment near the German border August 8, 1775. Think for a moment of the events in America at that time. August 8, 1775 is Lexington and Concord, the first shots of the revolution. He dines with the Duke of Gloucester, the brother of England's King George III. The encounter was lively as, Gro as Gloucester, a radical <coughs> rake, takes the sides of the American insurgents just to irk his brother, and was very much for the American revolutionaries and the ideals for which they were fighting. Human rights, liberty, equality, democracy. Lafayette never forgot that dinner. He described it as a turning point in his life. He wrote, From the moment I heard the name America, I loved it. I burned with a desire to spill my blood for her. He was caught up in the principles of the Enlightenment, expressed in the Declaration of Independence, a text he was very familiar with. Put it in perspective. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Later, in 1776, Benjamin Franklin arrived in Paris as an envoy to help win France's support for the American cause. 
Also, the United States Congress secretly sent Silas Dean to Paris as a recruiter. Lafayette saw an opportunity to gain the glory that he could not gain in France and got Silas Dean, Silas Dean to send him to the Continental Army with a commission as Major General. He's a teenager, but he's rich and he's connected. Lafayette bought a ship, outfitted it with cannon, named it La Victoire. His family was very embarrassed. When the king, probably through Lafayette's father-in-law, learned that Lafayette was going to leave France, he tried to stop him. But this knight errant on his white horse was not going to be deterred. He would be leaving behind Adrienne, who was pregnant at the time. In April, he carried out a scheme he had been forming for six months and left France on a long, arduous, six-week voyage with very heavy seas. Ocean crossings were horrible in those days. It appears that Lafayette was seasick most of the trip as he was a terrible sailor. He didn't write his first letter to his wife until he was halfway there, three weeks. I don't understand people who like the sea, he wrote. It is so sad and I am ill. The sea, the sea, always the sea, every day I like it, so lonely here. I think it was Franklin who said, I don't understand people who go to sea when there are perfectly good prisons on dry land. <laughs> I think it was Franklin that said that, I'm not sure, but it's, it's out of those times. <clears throat> After a couple of weeks, he begins to get his sea legs and rapidly begins learning English, which most of the other French officers did not do. Lafayette explained that you have to understand the people of liberty. He wrote to Adrienne, I go to defend liberty as a friend. The happiness of America is intimately tied to the happiness of all mankind. One day she will become the safe haven of tolerance, equality, and peaceful liberty. He was quite a visionary when he said that America was born for glory and prosperity. What amazing foresight. When Lafayette's ship arrived off the coast of South Carolina in June 77, they couldn't get into the port of Charleston because it was heavily blockaded by the British. So they sailed north looking for a safe harbor. Lafayette and six other French officers landed at a plantation near Charleston and started off on a 700 mile journey to Pennsylvania where the Congress was sitting, taking more than a month by carriage, horseback, and finally by foot, arriving in July of 77, exhausted at Philadelphia. He finds out where Continental Congress is meeting and knocks on the door of Independence Hall. They were met by the head of the Secret Committee for Foreign Soldiers, a Mr. Loveland, and he just told him to go away and he turned his back on them and walked back inside. So many French officers have presented themselves to the Continental Army asking for commissions. The Congress is really sick of, of, of dealing with them. They were rudely turned away like the worst kind of adventurers. And there were plenty of those in the, in the time. He wrote to Congress stating that after the sacrifices I have made, I have the right to be accepted as a volunteer and serve at my own expense. <coughs> The next day, a delegation from Congress apologized for the rude reception he had been given. They had received a letter of recommendation from Benjamin Franklin stating, he will help our cause no end, so please treat him well, and don't get him killed. But let him earn his glory on some important occasion. Both Washington and Franklin shrewdly realized that Lafayette was a person who could speak at the highest levels of the French government <coughs> who could become an advocate <coughs> for us. Lafayette met Washington and Philadelphia shortly after the battles of Princeton and Trenton. It was a bad day for Washington. He had just been told that 18,000 British regulars were on their way <coughs> to invade Philadelphia. And now he has to meet another French officer, a 19-year-old major general. It must have seemed like the perfect end to a very bad day. <laughs> Lafayette was, of course, thrilled. It probably started out as a polite gesture to a kid, with rich kid with connections. But Lafayette's modesty made a good first impression. 
September, Washington gives the teenager a chance to prove himself with the Continental Army, when the Continental Army marches out to stop 8,000 British and Hessian soldiers under General Charles Cornwallis at Brandywine Creek. Lafayette was given permission to ride out and support General Sullivan on the right. Cornwallis had broken across the river here and was pushing back the Continentals. While trying to reform the disorganized line, he hadn't noticed that he'd been wounded uh, uh, until blood started gushing from his boot. He had it attended to on the battlefield and continued to fight and helped to manage a chaotic retreat while wounded. <coughs> the battle was lost, allowing, to, allowing the British to take Philadelphia, but Lafayette was carried from the field of Brandywine as a hero. The handsome young general captured the public's Im imagination. His fame spread through the country and back across the Atlantic. Paris was ringing with reports of the first battle in which Lafayette brought glory to France and his fame spread throughout the country. <coughs> the same people who most blamed his rash adventure now applauded him. The fierce winter at Valley Forge was probably more horrible than we can imagine. Lafayette made a point of living with his men. They were in want of everything. They had no coats, no shoes. Feet and legs froze until they became black and it often became necessary to amputate them. They went for days without provisions and many deserted. Neither the public nor the Congress were supporting the Continental Army. They were expected to survive to keep the army together until the British lost their will to stay. Washington, while his men were freezing, was told to come to the defense of Philadelphia. Washington told Congress that he needed clothes and provisions. Men were dying of exposure. They were eating their shoes. A cabal in Congress was trying to replace Washington as commander-in-chief. Lafayette was tempted with offers to join Washington's enemies, but Lafayette remained steadfast and came to Washington's defense. Washington learned that Lafayette could be trusted. Washington notorious for keeping people at arm's length, is drawn to the young Lafayette. Washington was, has no son. The young Frenchman has no father. Lafayette now becomes part of Washington's small inner circle, what he calls his family. A great friendship develops between these two men as they discuss the principles of the American Revolution. Lafayette's growing fame and closeness to Washington becomes an embarrassment to the British. I would love to capture and humiliate Lafayette. Their chance came in late spring of 78. Lafayette is given a command, fitting a real major general, to lead a scouting expedition of 2,000 men near the British stronghold of Philadelphia. British generals Howe and Clinton felt so certain of Lafayette's capture that they sent out invitations to a party in Philadelphia which said, Lafayette will be president. Washington warned Lafayette that he was to be cautious and not lose his very valuable detachment to surprise and not to take up a stationary post but to be elusive and keep moving. On May 18th, Lafayette camped his troops on a hill. On the morning of the 20th, he found British dragoons approaching. His scouts could find no escape route. So he unconventionally attacked. From among trees, behind stone walls, he skillfully maneuvered his troops out of the trap and proved himself at only 20 years old to be an American soldier who could think on his feet. But Washington believed Lafayette could be more valuable as a lobbyist to the court of the King Louis at Versailles. He is seen as the key to the French treasury and French supplies, financial support, troops, and the French Navy. Given Lafayette's connections, he can speak to the people at the highest levels of the French government. By the time Lafayette gets back to France, there is already a treaty of alliance between America and France. The French realize that Americans might have a chance of winning. The basic principle of French policy at the time was anything bad for Britain is good for France. They were natural enemies in Europe. And it was a good bet. Let's support the revolutionaries a little so it ties down Britain. But the extent, of, the extent of French support in the treaty wasn't spelled out. 
At first, the king puts Lafayette under house arrest as a slap on the wrist for going to America without permission. And Lafayette is welcomed at court, getting swept up in a round of festive balls. <coughs> By March 20th, 1780, with the king's promise of 10,000 French troops and a fleet from the West Indies, Lafayette sails back to America. Hopefully, the reinforcements will arrive in time. Now, when he sailed back to America, he brought with him, I believe at his own expense, remember he was rich, a thousand stand of arms, that is, a musket made in a French arsenal. That's the way the, the French acquired their, their weapons. They had state arsenals that manufactured them. They didn't contract it out like the, you know, the British did. You can always tell the French style Charleville because the barrel is held to the stock with these bands. That's the key right there. It's plainer, it's simpler, it's more utilitarian. There is less embellishment, less decoration than on a brown bass, the standard British musket. Where are you loading it? Hmm? Where are you loading the it? The only hole there is is right up here. And that's the... That's, yeah, that's the way it's done. That's another, that's another lecture. A stand of arms included a musket. A cartridge box in the French style. <coughs> you can see the way the strap is held on with buckles. This tab goes on the button on the back of the coat so that the cartridge box doesn't swing forward. And 100 cartridges and six flints. Okay. Of course, the, the musket also included a bayonet. For every, off, for every officer, he sent silver tape <coughs> to lace the caps of the officers. Or, for instance, on Tom's tricorded hat, you see where it's white? That would be silver tape that would go around for all the officers that he commanded. And for every sergeant, they brought them a sword. All the NCOs, the officers had swords, but he provided swords. This is out of his own pocket. But he could, when a rich kid takes up a hobby, he takes up a hobby, right? He also provided a plume, black tipped red turkey feather plume, the way it's described, for the helmets of the light infantrymen. This helmet is a replica of what the light infantrymen would wear. The white was the same color as whatever the facings of the regiment were. This would be a northern regiment, and what I do is a 10th Massachusetts. I was at a reenactment in 1978 at Monmouth, and the guest speaker was the current, present day, Marquis de Lafayette, who spoke not a word of English. He had a lovely wife who translated his brief remarks. And as he came down the stairs, I got my reenactment group, eight of us, all dressed up as light infantry with the helmets. I took my helmet off and I said, please tell Monsieur Le Marquis that his illustrious ancestor commanded a group like this that we present, we portray. And he gave each man a black tipped red turkey feather plume. And he grabbed the helmet out of my hand and started jabbering. And his wife explained, He's explaining to you that black tip red turkey feather plumes were the emblem of the Lafayette family. And he handed it back. <coughs> so I can say I did get my helmet from the Marquis of Lafayette <laughs> in 1978, not 1778. But 200 years later, the Marquis de Lafayette handed me that hat. <coughs> Thousand stand of arms. When he gets to Boston, they welcome him with a salute of cannon, ringing of church bells, and a band marching ahead of him and cheering from the assembled crowd. The northern states were pretty well safe back then. The British had kind of given them up as being worthless anyway. They wanted the rich southern states. He was disappointed to find out that the French troops would not be commanded by Lafayette himself. 
but by Count de Rochambeau. While Lafayette has dreams of leading that charge that will push the British out of New York City, that ain't gonna happen. But Washington has other plans for him. There are, the main boulevard in Providence, Rhode Island is Rochambeau Avenue. Uh, they were, the, the French fleet was quartered in Newport, Rhode Island, and there are a lot of French influence, uh, French names in, in, in and around Rhode Island that go back to the Revolution. Lafayette is sent south with a Virginia militia to fight his old enemy, Lord, George, Lord Charles Horn Wallace. Virginia, Washington's home state, wanted someone more senior to be sent to their rescue, but Washington told him, don't underestimate Lafayette. From Richmond, Virginia, in May, Lafayette writes to Washington that if he were to stand and fight in a formal battle, he would be cut to pieces, the militia dispersed, and the arms lost. To decline fighting, Virginia would think herself given up. I am therefore determined to skirmish, but not engage too far. I am not strong enough even to get beaten. This is not the French way of fighting. This is not the European way of fighting. This is fighting like the Indians, attack and withdraw before the enemy can organize a reaction. Washington learned this fighting style in the French and Indian War, or as the, British, the Europeans call it, the Seven Years' War. He learned that the hard way uh, in, in his early uh, military career for the British, that this, this hit and run kind of thing is what was effective in, in wilderness and in uncharted territory and un, not open pastures. And the digression here, <coughs> you all remember Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the North Vietnamese. <coughs> he was a great admirer of George Washington, politically and militarily. He spent a good deal of time in Boston as a pastry cook at the Ritz Carlton. But he learned a lot of American history there. And he learned those tactics. And if you think back to our experience in Vietnam, what did North Vietnam do? Hit and run. They didn't stand up and do formal set battles. They, they just annoyed the hell out of you. They picked at the edges. And it was just that annoying. Not knowing where it was going to be. Everybody kept everybody nervous, kept everybody alert, soaked up a lot of treasure, a lot of men, and what happened? We ended up saying, it's just not worth it. We're never going to stop these people. And it was from George Washington that they learned that lesson. And that's what he's implying now. That's actually mentioned on a MASH, um, one of the MASH uh, segments. Yeah. Uh, they, they talk about that. That's not appropriate for, for the Korean War, because Korean War, those were mass assaults, those were human wave assaults. They just threw people at you. That was not, that was not guerrilla warfare in, in, in Korea. So that, that's inappropriate if it was used in match. I didn't, don't know it, but that's, that's bad history if it was used in match. Well, that's what somebody had said, because we, in fact, we were just talking about that the other night. And, well, anyway, well, I, and not to interrupt, but it, sometimes it's not right. Yeah. Uh, don't trust television for your history. It, it's, it's literary license. In the interest of keeping this short, I'm going to skip over the well-plowed ground of Cowpens and King Mo Kings Mountain and Nathaniel Green's campaign here in the Carolinas and North Carolina. But Lafayette was also in vain. He never did get to link up with Green, which is kind of like what he was trying to do. And he, he and Green kind of played cat and mouse with Cornwallis's forces. <laughs> So Cornwallis couldn't attack one because the other one would get him from behind. So Cornwallis had to gradually pull back. It was getting to him. He, he, uh, uh, the major outcome of Green and Lafayette's campaigns was to wear down Cornwallis' troops, forcing them to seek resupply at a major port. By June, Washington sends reinforcements south, and Lafayette, with 5,000 men, sets off after Cornwallis across Virginia to Yorktown, to Chesapeake Bay. Lafayette sent a number of supplies into Cornwallis' encampment, one being an African-American slave named James Armistead, one of the first known American secret agents. Armistead infiltrates Cornwallis' camp and feeds Cornwallis false information and tells Lafayette what the British general is planning. Now, 
Interestingly, in the American Revolution, the most effective spies were blacks. Because the British didn't notice them. They were like the person that cleans up the tables, the janitor in the corridor mopping the floor. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't even thought to be, when they, were, they could be in the room and secrets could be discussed. And they, they weren't people. They just, they were there. They're like a lamppost or a, or a, a table. They could go anywhere. My master sent me to go and get this. If you've seen the, the, uh, the play Hamilton, one of the four characters with Hamilton is a spy in New York. I can't remember the name, McGonagall or something like that. Well, he was a slave. He was a slave of a tailor in New York City. And the tailor was a, a, a rebel sympathizer. And all the British officers would go to the tailor for you know, they're tailoring, they had their own uniforms tailored. And things like the officer would show up and say, I need a night cloak and I need it by tomorrow because I've got, we're marching Thursday out to the island. And there's McGonagall in the corner sweeping the floor and he hears it. And he's just a slave, he just walks through the lines. I'm just going up to the farm, my master's farm. And he gets through the line and he tells Washington, hey, they're marching out tomorrow. It's those little tidbits like that, that slaves and blacks free or slave, could pick up. Because they were like, you know, the cat in the corner. Nobody paid attention to them. And Washington used them very effectively. Anyway, um, Lafayette outmaneuvers Cornwallis and pins him down in Yorktown. Washington races south upon hearing the news, and Rochambeau starts moving the troops down Overland from Rhode Island, uh, from Newport, Rhode Island, to get to the south. There's a, there's a story of where they marched through Connecticut, and at one point, his 10,000 <coughs> troops drank so much water out of the stream they drank it dry. Drank a running stream dry. That's a lot of men, and it's a lot of drinking. Um, the fear was that they wouldn't get there in time before the promised French fleet coming up from the West Indies. They would arrive too late. So what was happening, if you picture the East Coast, the fleet, French fleet down here in the West Indies, you got a British fleet up here in New York, and you got Cornwallis here in Virginia, the Chesapeake. Well, if the British fleet could get up to him in time, they could take him off. Traps <coughs> worthless. But if the French fleet could get down, and block the British, Cornwallis is stuck. Mm -hmm. August 14th, 25 French warships under Admiral Comte de Grasse are sighted at the mouth of the Chesapeake River. They attack the British fleet that has come to rescue Cornwallis in what becomes known as the Battle of the Capes. The battle oh, would technically be called a draw because they Butted heads, and the British fleet went back to New York, and the French fleet went back to the Bahamas, the Indies. Well, it may have technically been a draw, but the British didn't get to accomplish their mission of picking up Cornwallis. So it was a French victory and an American victory. Cornwallis now has no avenue of retreat from Yorktown, and both sides settled down for a classic European <coughs> siege. They're trying to tell us something. They're trying to tell us something. They're trying to tell us something. still diners out there. Yeah, let's keep Anyway, before de Grasse arrived at the Chesapeake and Washington and Rochambeau were still on the march, de Grasse was insisting that Lafayette lead an attack on Cornwallis and finish him off. But Lafayette refused. Many of his men would have died, and he had he undertaken the attack. When he first came to America seeking, seeking glory, he was full of vinegar and wanted to become famous. But he had grown up in the course of the war and formed a deep attachment with his troops. And so attached to the American cause that he insisted that they wait for Washington and Rochambeau to arrive with their troops from the north. Lafayette was given the place of glory after all. He was given, a siege starts out very simply. You start out by building a trench outside of the cannon shot of your enemy in the town. Then you, that's the first parallel. 
Then you dig zigzag trenches this way and that way. They're zigzag, so they can't fire a cannonball down them, okay? They zigzag. And then when you get up into cannon shot, then you build a second parallel. Okay? Guys with shovels. And they have baskets that they fill with the earth. That's their defense. They shovel it into the baskets. And then you can't leave a gap. The British had two redoubts, two little forts, if you're the British, on this side, on the Americans, okay? Redoubt 10 and Redoubt 9. You can't build the next parallel with those behind you, so you've got to capture those two redoubts. And Lafayette's given the place of glory after all. He has command of the troops closest to the enemy's outer defenses, the right wing, his right wing. Under his command, led by Alexander Hamilton, and they squabbled over who would have the army, 400 Continental Army Light <coughs> Infantry troops, including the Light Company from the 10th Massachusetts that I portray, bravely charged and took Redoubt Number 10 in the French way with unloaded muskets and fixed bayonets. They had learned that stopping to fire just gave the enemy more time to shoot at you. <laughs> if you ran at him with your bayonet, you could cover the ground and he'd only get one shot off at you. But if you stopped the fire, he'd get two or three shots off at you. So rush him with the bayonet. Rochambeau's troops took Redoubt Number 9. So American and French. And by this time, uh, the Lafayette had been given command of all the light infantry. What they did was every regiment had nine companies. The first company had to be kept up to full strength. And it had to be the best formed men. Not the old guys, not the kids, good, capable, solid soldiers. And when spring came and the campaign season started, that light company was taken away from the regiment and put into a brigade, a, a brigade of light infantry. They were, I forget, had uh, the division. He had two brigades. Each brigade was made up of three battalions. Each battalion was 400 men. So he had 2,400 men technically under his, uh, under his command. And they were the best. They were the best. They were the elite. Okay. Now, once they had taken Redoubts 9 and 10, Cornwallis' position was hopeless. It was the end of the game. He could do nothing. The Americans would move their cannons up, place them, and just bombard the hell out of them. He was in an untenable position. Now, being flanked both left and right, he had nothing left but to surrender. Now, Cornwallis himself was not faulted for this defeat. Because no British general who backed himself up to the sea and blew the whistle and called for the Navy was doing anything wrong. This was the Navy's failure or the French fleet's success. In fact, General Cornwallis became Governor General of India, a not insignificant possession of the British Empire. He had a long and successful career after his defeat. After the, at the surrender ceremonies at Yorktown, a column of British troops stretching over a mile in length marched between lines of French troops on one side and American troops on the other. They made a point of looking only at the French troops and where, described by one eyewitness as, their line of march we remarked a disorderly and unsoldierly conduct. Their step was irregular, their ranks frequently broken. Lafayette ordered his drum major to play <coughs> Yankee Doodle, which was what the British used to pay, play to insult the Americans as being yokels. He had them play Yankee Doodle. Uh, the English all turned their heads in surprise at the taunt now, there are differing accounts as to who played what at the ceremonies, some having the British play the world turned upside down, which is an appropriate title for that at the time, which sounds a lot like Yankee Doodle. So it could have been either way. Uh, since Cornwallis was evacuated, a small sloop, he got all, the surrender, uh, uh, before the surrender ceremonies, his second in command, General O'Hara, 
offered his sword to Rochambeau. They didn't recognize the Americans as a country. It wasn't the Americans that defeated him, it was the French. But Rochambeau pointed to Washington, refusing the sword. Washington, in turn, pointed to his second in command, General Benjamin Lincoln. You may remember that Benjamin Lincoln was denied the honors of war when he surrendered the Southern Army at Charleston in 1780 to the British. So they didn't treat him as an enemy combatant, merely just a rebel criminal. So Washington wasn't going to accept the surrender from Cornwallis's second in command. He had him surrender to his second in command, who was the guy the British didn't give the rights of war to. Justice. Yeah, just a twist. The formalities, the, you know, that, that interplay, the politics there. Um, uh, Benjamin Lincoln played a major, major role in the siege of Yorktown and later served as Secretary of War. When it came time to give up their arms and accoutrements, the British troops acted in a surly and southern manner, throwing their muskets into a pile with violence. Bad news all around. It's just an ugly, ugly scene. They were sore losers. With the war over, Lafayette returned to the Virginia capital and won an appeal for the emancipation of his former spy, James Armistead. To honor the general, James took Lafayette as his new last name. We'll hear more later. Lafayette returned to Paris in January of 1782. It was a triumphant return. He was greeted like a pop star. Riding on his horse, women wanted to kiss his boots. He was greeted as a hero of two worlds. Adrienne learned of his, return, of his return while visiting Queen Marie Antoinette, and the Queen accompanied her in her carriage so she too could welcome the American hero. Adrienne fainted when she saw him. Lafayette is impatient to see France transformed by the democratic ideas he's embraced. But first he writes to Washington many letters passionately urging his mentor and dearest friend to perfect the American experiment in democracy by removing the stain of slavery. Lafayette is a man of freedom. He and Adrienne asked the French ministry to free the French slaves in Guiana, one of their colonies. They purchased a plantation there, La Belle Gabrielle, to give an example of gradual emancipation with the aim of teaching freed slaves the skills to become free servants. Lafayette's efforts to bring democracy to France unleashed forces beyond his control. His role in the French Revolution leads to his uncertain place in French history, where once his statue was in <coughs> the biggest plazas, they're now hidden behind trees. They've been moved. He helps to get it started just a few years after returning from America. He wanted to be the French Washington. With the help of Thomas Jefferson, America's ambassador to France, Lafayette drafts the Declaration of the Rights of Man. I have a copy here, but maybe if we have time, I may get into that. But maybe Lafayette's greatest contribution to the cause of democracy is his vision of human rights as the core value of a society. The people of Paris are inflamed by more radical voices and storm the Bastille and parade with severed heads on pikes. Lafayette is given charge of the National Guard responsible for restoring order. And when he drives the mob away from the Bastille and recaptures it, he keeps the key. And he later, in 1790, gives the key to the Bastille to George Washington. It's at Mount Vernon now. He finds himself in an untenable position, caught in the middle of the French Revolution. He's a tragic figure in that sense for democracy, for democracy, but against the excess of the radicals who take control of the revolution. Caught between the monarchists on the right and the populists on the left. In October of 1789, his efforts brings the two sides together. And they're played out in three memorable days. A huge crowd of women marches on Versailles and threatens the queen, dramatically exposing Lafayette's precarious position as both the champion of freedom and the figure of authority. 
Did the mob really want to kill the king and queen? Is he going to fire on women? Does he defend the queen? What is he to do to defuse the situation? Lafayette thinks on his feet and leads the queen out of her balcony <coughs> for the mob to see. He bows and kisses her hand. This dramatic gesture Ruth, achieves a momentary truce. July 1790, on the first anniversary of the storming of Bastille, a quarter of a million people rally around Lafayette and his plan for a constitution to give them both liberty and a king to protect order, a constitutional monarchy. They celebrate on a field where the Eiffel Tower now stands. It's a magic moment of reconciliation for all the French. There's a great celebration. Lafayette is a hero of the proposed constitutional monarchy plan. A year later, Lafayette is overwhelmed by the violent sources, forces he's been trying to keep in check. In July of 1791, radical factions incite an angry mob to riot in the same field where they had cheered Lafayette. Someone fires a shot. They miss, but his troops open fire on the crowd. There's still dispute as to who gave the order to fire. You remember the events at Lexington and Concord? Militia lined up here, British marching up a road. The British aren't going to march in front, across the front of a militia lined up. So they say, disband. While they're arguing back and forth, <coughs> a shot is fired. At which times the British fire back. Now whether it was some of the militiamen lined up that fired the shot, or somebody behind a building who just wanted to start something firing a shot, it's almost that same scenario. <coughs> we don't know which side, a provocateur or one of the two sides. Somebody just wanted to see a, a, a fight start up. Anyway, he couldn't hold the ends together. France had so much more revolt to revolt about than America did. Revolution spills out of control. Thousands of people flee to nearby countries. In the next year and a half, nearly 3,000 people more, including Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, would die on the guillotine. Lafayette is now viewed as a traitor by both sides. He tries to escape, hoping to reach America, but he's taken prison, prisoner by the Austrians, whose Emperor Francis II, brother of Marie Antoinette, despises Lafayette for inspiring a democratic wave that's sweeping Europe. Lafayette ends up in a series of prisons, moving further east in Europe until he finally ends up in Olmutz, in what is today the Czech Repub Republic. Adrienne fears she'll end up on the guillotine. George Washington, now president of the United States, tried in vain to help her. She's in prison for three long years and is finally released as the terror ends. As soon as she is free, she begs the Emperor of Austria to let her join Lafayette in prison, and she takes her two daughters with her. September of 1797, the constant support of Washington and the Americans finally bring their release. While Lafayette was in exile, Adrienne became a political woman, visiting Napoleon to negotiate for his release and return to France. But her illness from the stay in prison only left them a few more years. They spent their last years at LaGrange, one of her family's estates outside of Paris. One of her family's estates. I tell you, they were rich. When Lafayette died about 30 years later, he was wearing a portrait of Adrienne on a locket around his neck. He did live to see how democracy had been brought to life in the United States. On the eve of the 50th anniversary of the Revolution, do the math, <coughs> President James Monroe invited General Lafayette to return to America, a unifying hero who everybody in America can thank for their country's independence. 80,000 people welcomed his arrival in New York City, when the population of New York City was only 120,000. 80,000 people. Think of a big football stadium. It's only 120,000 people in New York City. 80,000 turned out. This marks the beginning of his 13-month victory lap around America, where he visits all of the then 24 states. His return gives the country the opportunity to refocus on what brought us together in the first place. Congress has a banquet for Lafayette, and he says, someday America will save the world. 
Many years later, on July 4th, 1917, General Pershing visited Lafayette's grave. And he utters one of the most famous quotes of World War I. Lafayette, nous sommes ici. Lafayette, we are here. Lafayette uses the tour to ask Americans if their country is living up to their promise. He returns to his beloved Virginia, where one of the biggest crowds in the tour gathers for a rally at the state capitol. Lafayette suddenly stops the parade and steps out of his carriage as he recognizes a face in the crowd. It's his former spy, James Armistead Lafayette, now a free man. In tears, the two embrace while the whole city of slaveholders looks on. August 30th, 1825, just before he sails home, Lafayette visits the tomb of George Washington at Mount Vernon with his son, George Washington Lafayette. By his side, the old man kneels to scoop something up before they depart. He took a handful of earth from America that he wanted to be buried in. He died May 20th, 1834. He lies next to Adrienne in a little bit of American soil. Pronounce him one of the first men of his age, and you have not done him justice. John Quincy Adams. Monsieur de Lafayette had only one idea. Happily, it was the idea of the century. Francois René de Chateaubriand. <laughs> Humanity has won its battle. Liberty now has a country. Gilbert de Lafayette. That is a hero. Okay. Any questions? Any questions?